Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the Chairman, Honourable Members, Distinguished Guests, Honourable Minister, and colleagues. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share the latest advances in library technology. I uh, wish you the most wonderful interactions and sharing of information this week. It is excellent that great minds have the opportunity to meet. Dr. Joel Sam mentioned the power of togetherness. In the information world, this is very important. This is the core theme. As the largest aggregator, EBSCO, as well as a community of the libraries and academics, with our help, I believe we can make a, a huge impact on the continent um, and the world. So thank you again. I wish you many blessings this week, uh, and thank you so much. All right, so we are now going to invite the Minister for Information of the Republic of Ghana to officially launch this conference. He's in the person of the Honorable Dr. Mustafa Hamid. Please welcome him. Professor Chair, um, Professor Nana Jane Opokwa um, former Minister for Education, and my former Vice Chancellor. I'll come back to her in a bit. <laughs> um, Academics, librarians, ladies and gentlemen of the media, um, good morning. First of all, I want to thank the Consortium of Academic Research Libraries um, in Ghana um, for inviting me to be guest of honor at this event. Naturally, in my view, it should have been the Minister for Education who comes to open a conference like this, but the fact that you knew that Ghana had a Minister for Education and yet invited me shows that perhaps you hold me in some esteem and I'm very grateful for that. Um, it is difficult, as I said, I said I was going to come back to Professor Jane. Um, it's difficult to have your teacher <laughs> sit large at an occasion like this and then you proceed to pretend to be knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sure she's forgotten. Um, when I went to University of Cape Coast, the very first lecture, the very first lecture that I ever attended was her literature in English lecture. And she said to us, you know, level 100 people, she said to us, when you come to the university, you ought to leave a lot of your assumptions and prejudices behind. He says, here, obia nyobia. He says, so from now on, you are not going to say, uh, Professor Soso and So said this, or Dr. Soso and So, or I read it in the daily graphic, so it must be true. He says, no, if you can punch even a single hole in a professor's argument, it comes tumbling. And that is what you should seek to do as students. Be independent thinking and not be overawed by anybody's academic credentials or anything like that. So I'm going to pretend that I'm not overawed <laughs> by her presence. <laughs> and to proceed to say what I want to say. Um, your theme, Managing Research Outputs for National Development Trends and Issues, um, in my view, is apt. Perhaps this is a conversation that we should be having every day in Africa. Because quite frankly, Africa is not going to get out of its present mess without research. Research, in my view, should form the basis for every public policy and for every national development um, issue. And to the extent that you are the repositories of research. 
shows how important you are in the national development mix. Or even if you want, in the continental development mix. Because there are people here um, from other nations as well. Now, as people who manage university libraries, your importance is also underscored by the fact that when students go to university for the first time, I mean level 100 students, after the university's identity card, the next set of cards that they are giving are library cards. So that, that, that tells a story that after you say, now I am a, a student of this university, the, the identity, the next set of identification that you are giving is a library card. First of all, it tells the student that this is the fundamental reason for which you came here, that you came to study, even before you go and get a hall card or a sociology student's association card or whatever, whatever other card. You have a library card. And it is a card that you guard jealously and which you return at the end of four years when you have finished the university. In our days in the university, we would outcompete ourselves to borrow books in order not for it to be said that somebody came to your room and found your library cards still sitting on your shelves. Nowadays, I realize that when students come to the university and they are giving the library cards, we used to be giving seven. I don't know how many there are, whether it's now 10 or six, I don't know. Now, these days, students take the library cards, professor, and then they go and leave them at home. And then when they have finished at the end of four years, they will bring them back intact and hand them over to the library. And I'm saying this not as a story. I know that as a fact. When I was teaching at the University of Cape Coast, there was a day I had exhausted my pack of cards as lecturer. And so I called one of the students and said, please go to your dormitory and bring me two of your library cards. I want to go and borrow some books from the library. And she said to me, that say, I have left them at home, meaning Accra, <laughs> because I don't want them to get lost so that when I'm being cleared at the end of four years, I would not be cleared. Quite frankly, I was very saddened. Because what it means is that she didn't intend at all to ever visit the library or even to borrow a book. So what it means is that she was intent on depending only on the lecturer's notes to be able to pass an exam. Now when you have a generation of students like that coming up, then you ought to be frightened about the prospects of our country's progress. And therefore, you as repositories of research have an enormous task in making our libraries attractive places for young people. When we were growing up as young people in Tamale, the Tamale Regional Library, our parents registered us compulsorily with the Tamale Regional Library. And every week, we would go and borrow a book and read and return. And there was competition amongst us to see who read the most books in a term. I'm not so sure whether that culture exists anymore. And it is important that you develop, you help people to learn. And the way that you can do it is to take advantage of information technology. Right now, if I want to do a piece of research, I may have to literally begin to travel around the various university campuses to find out which book exists in which library and so on. It should be possible in this day and age for us to have a platform where I can go in and click and find out whether this book is present at the University of Cape Coast Library or it is there at the university, before I even go to Kaneshi to attempt to board a vehicle and go to Cape Coast. You may not make it accessible at all, or you can make it accessible for a fee. 
as we do these days what they call um, open access journals. You know, some you pay, some you don't pay. But whatever it is, if somebody is looking for a book, he should be able to sit in Accra and know that the book is at the KNUST library before, before he even begins to travel to Kumasi to, 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 to search for that book. You, you may have to think how to do it. Whilst I was sitting at the table, I was flipping through um, the book that also has um, the list of topics to be delivered. And one of them attracted my attention. It says, making sense of the nonsense. <laughs> the importance of oral narratives and archival information and academic research and writing. Um, I wish I would have the time to come and sit and see how to make sense of nonsense. <laughs> but really and truly, you also have a responsibility to make libraries attractive places and comfortable places for people to be able to make sense of all the nonsense, in quotes, that is stored in our libraries. You immortalize people. That's what you also do. Long after I have written my academic papers and published them and I'm dead and gone, you are the ones that will keep that knowledge alive for generations of people to come. And for people who immortalize others and what they came to the world to do, you are a very important group of people and your organization is a very, very important organization that every government must take seriously. And therefore, apart from the Minister for Education, whose responsibility it is to you and what you do, I offer myself, because what I do for a living is speaking. I offer myself, apart from being spokesman for the president, as your additional spokesperson. <laughs> And quite frankly, I mean that because I'm fundamentally an academic before I am a politician. Indeed, there's no profession called politician. <laughs> when I fill forms <laughs> and they say profession, I write educationist, not politician. So fundamentally, that's who I am. And therefore, I want to be your advocate. And to say that if you have any ideas that will promote the culture of learning and the value of libraries and the library system in our national development, if you have ideas apart from taking them to the Ministry of Education, please bring them to me so I can also serve as an additional voice so that we can begin to do the kinds of things that we need to do to put the library at the center of national um, development. I want to make one last suggestion before I declare the thing open. We can also organize annual, biannual, or whatever you want, fairs. You can call it a library fair or whatever. I don't know whether it's being done. But if it's not being done, I'm sure it's a suggestion that you can think about. That allows us, all of these libraries, to come together in one place over a two-day period or three-day period that allows students, academics, and everybody to come around, okay, and be told that, oh, this is welcome to KNUST stand. This is what we have. These are, we have this number of books. We have that. We have that. So that people know, as I said, apart from the initial suggestion I gave, about an electronic platform where people can find out what is there. These fairs would also allow people to find out what is available in which library and to inform academics and researchers where to go when they want a particular resource or a particular book for research purposes. It's something that you should also um, think about. So, ladies and gentlemen, once again, I am very grateful um, for the invitation. Um, right now, 
I would declare this um, conference duly open. I wish you fruitful deliberation. God bless us and God bless our nation, Ghana. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That was the Minister for Information of the Republic of Ghana, the Honorable Dr. Mustafa Hamid. Thank you for being uh, an advocate henceforth for Kalik. <laughs> All right. Now, just um, now we would call on the chair for Kalik Management Committee, uh, Dr. Joel Sam. He has a presentation to make to the minister. Please welcome him. I think the Honorable Minister has the presentation already. <laughs> and, 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 and I think that, uh, you know, I'm 60 plus. And, and normally when you say you, they say you are old, they say you are a witch or a wizard. <laughs> I, I brought this knowing that the minister will say that he will be an advocate for libraries. <laughs> this afternoon at 2 p.m. I have a meeting at the Library Authority. And I will tell the acting executive director, Hayford Siang, that the Minister for Information says he's an advocate. Because last week in Devon, he was there and all that, so he knows about this. So thank you, Mr. Minister. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> all right, thank you. Okay, before we continue with the program, some um, acknowledgments. I would like to acknowledge the presence of the University Librarian of University of Ghana, Professor Perpetua Dazi. Thank you for coming. And then also the University Librarian, well, the Librarian for Kofi Annan Peacekeeping Center, uh, Ms. Mary Akofu. In fact, former, yeah, former, sorry. <laughs> The former librarian, yes. Thank you <laughs> for the correction. And then we also have the Professor Regina Apia Opong from the Noguchi Memorial Institute for Medical Research, University of Ghana. And Ms. Nudumo Dlamini from the AAU, Association of African Universities. And then Dr. Violet Makuku. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Mr. Entia Mensa, the former librarian of the University of Cape Coast, is also here. <laughs> All right. Thank you. He's at the back there. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's now time for us to take the keynote address on the theme, Managing Research Outputs for National Development Trends and Issues. And we have an august person to deliver this keynote address. She is currently the president of the Forum for African Women Educationalists and chairperson of the Africa Board. And she is a former, I mean, she is a, a former vice chancellor of the University of Cape Coast a former Minister of Education, Ghana. She's a professor of literature. And also, she is the first person to hold that position of Vice Chancellor, I mean, woman Vice Chancellor in Ghana. That's a great accomplishment. And at the University of Cape Coast, she was the head of Department of English, and then also the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, the Dean of the Board of Graduate Studies, and founding Dean of the School of Graduate Studies and Research. Professor Opukwa Jiman holds a Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in French and English, a Diploma in Education from the University of Cape Coast, a Diploma in Advanced Studies in French from the University of Dakar, a Master of Arts and PhD in Literature from York University, Toronto, Canada. Her areas of research include literature by women from Africa, issues in the African diaspora, oral literature in Africa, and issues in education. In 2006, she was one of five scholars selected from around the world to address the United Nations Assembly during the 200th anniversary of the abolition of slavery. She is the recipient of many international awards, including four honorary doctorate degrees, the Global Leadership Award, 
Officer of the Order of Volta, Global Women Achievers Award, and many others. She has been, or is still, a member of the boards and committees that include the Executive Board of the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, Global Advisory Council, World Learning Incorporated, USA, Editorial Board of the Harriet Tubman Series on the African Diaspora, published by the Africa World Press Incorporated, USA, Africa Initiative, Canada, Adam Matthew Digital, UK. Professor Pukwajiman has been twice a Fulbright Scholar and is currently a member of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences and a lifetime fellow of the Commonwealth of Learning. She has recently been appointed Chancellor of the Women's University in Africa, located in Harare, Zimbabwe. Professor Pukwajiman. <laughs> I can go on and on and on and on. Okay, let me tell you some personal things about her. She is blessed with three adult children, Dr. Kweku Opukwajiman, researcher, UCLA, Berkeley, USA. Dr. Kwabina Opukwajiman, lecturer, University of Ghana. In fact, he taught me. He was my TA at the English department. And then Miss Mami Ajwa Opukwajiman. She's now a, doc a doctoral candidate at the University of Toronto, Canada, whom I also taught. I was a TA to her. <laughs> 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 and a proud grandmother of 16-month-old Nana Kwesiesuman Opukwajiman. What a woman. She is the keynote speaker for today. Please welcome her with a standing ovation, Professor Nana Jane Opukwajiman. Sorry. Thank you very much. Please sit down. <laughs> it looks like today is a day of revelations. <laughs> Um, let me begin by addressing the chair for the occasion, Professor Ahile. Address the Minister for Information, Mr. Fahmid, and go on to address members of the Management Committee and Local Organizing Committee for this meeting, and also to welcome all of you to the meeting. But I need to mention Mr. Clement Etuamensa and Dr. Kobler, who ensured I was here. In fact, yesterday, <laughs> Dr. Kobler called. <laughs> and I was telling my daughter over the phone in the evening that I'm getting too known for moving around too much. So <laughs> they needed to sh ensure I was here. Yes, it's a dear revelation, but I promised the minister I, would, I wasn't going to say everything I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll keep my word. And I believe you'll be happy that I kept my word. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Carl, I, you know, I've been very much interested in this organization. I think right from the beginning, many years ago, and when we started these conferences. Because as he said, wherever you move to, you are still a scholar, you are still an academic, you are still a teacher. And I can't imagine a better job and a better profession than being a teacher. And my love for the libraries, you know, once you're a teacher, you're always looking for information. Once you're a lecturer, you're always moving in and out. And so from my student days, you know, I remember those days, it was a late Mr. Cranting, who was a librarian at the University of Cape Coast, who told me that I was trying to get his job. I just found the library such a serene, such a peaceful place, and a place where you could get a lot of the things you needed to get. And therefore, the library is also the place where the information is stored. And that is the, the focal point of my presentation. And towards the end, I'm going to make one or two suggestions on how we can consider changing the face of the library as we have come to know it all these years. Because the library is not separate from development. The library is not separate from society. The library is a place where research findings are kept, and research findings must, by definition, be directly related to what goes on in society. 
This is because the centrality of research to development in all its varied manifestations is now a nearly universally acknowledged imperative. We used to think researchers were just a few people making noise out there. Remember when all the research about global warming started and nobody took anybody seriously. Now we are all paying a huge price for it. Research leads to new data or ideas or novel ways in which old problems can be addressed, or new ones even be predicted and confronted. The collection of research effort is expected to benefit the society as a whole. I think this is important. It's not only meant for other researchers, it's for everyone. And everyone of which the researcher forms part. So you see the symbiotic relationship that must exist between the researcher, or rather among the researcher, the research output, and the user. Okay. A significant part of the core business of any university, therefore, whether it is described as a teaching university or a research one, is to discover knowledge for the advancement of society. And this may be achieved in a variety of ways including both tangible and intangible outcomes. It is all a matter of focus and the energies expended. I will focus now on university as research center and a critical venue of knowledge creation and, to support, and a support arm, which is a library, which is a major place where knowledge, is, which is so created, will most likely be stored. My rationale is that the library is the heartbeat of any university. And even outside of the university setting, both managing information emanating from research output for the purposes of development at all levels, community, national, continental, and global. No, te no teaching university can avoid research. Universities, by definition, do not simply create the opportunities for the acquisition of new ways of, of seeing, which we call teaching. The universities do not simply use information already generated. This may be done at the levels of education leading to the university. Important though the, the lower levels are, the outcome of the effort at research should necessarily lead to the creation of the phase for the development of further ways of seeing also known as the advancement of knowledge. Stated more clearly, if not differently, the university, by the very nature of being so named, cannot and should not even contemplate the possibility of not placing research and the needs of the community at the heart of its endeavors. A major point of departure is to strengthen the capacities of universities to foster innovations that are responsive to demands of users in their varied manifestations. This may be achieved through an alignment of training of high quality researchers, impact oriented research and collaborative working relations among the researchers themselves, in tandem with the private sector and all users, and the all users here should include all manner of persons, all manner of workers, be they farmers, traders, food processors, health practitioners, whether in the formal or informal sector. And I'm building the argument towards why I think we can begin to interrogate the very nature of libraries. Research libraries are distinguished from other types, and I think that is why you are having a hard time explaining why the public libraries were not yet members. <laughs> These will mainly be concerned with the aggregation, the curation and utilization of metadata about research activities. Along with activities by funders, publishers, we can reliably connect a complex scholarly communications landscape of researchers, affiliations, publications, data sets, grants, projects, and their persistent identifiers all in the interest of national development. The library today, obviously, is playing an ever-expanding role in research information management at institutions worldwide and are placed to offer considerable expert advice that give way to publications harvesting, 
discoverability, training, support for researchers, and stewardship of the scholarly record. May I posit from this established expectation of libraries that libraries have been doing more or less the same thing, but better and better, aided by more and more equipment. How different can these roles, how, how can we add new, new roles to these existing ones? We may attempt a few ideas in the course of this presentation. The scope of my presentation, therefore, is focused on the theme, Managing Research Output for National Development Trends and Issues. And the topic itself, as we all know, is far-reaching indeed. We might not have the space in my presentation for a detailed examination of each, but, I have, but having gone through the programs, I know that each aspect will be thoroughly examined. But the topic urges us to, to consider the that the research is already conducted and that the business of the research library is to consider ways in which the output, output can be so managed that it results in national development. But we need constantly to interrogate what contributes to make these. Who selects the information? How is it edited and presented? What are the motives? We focus on how libraries come into the picture of handling the outcomes of research for national development. As a result, we will consider storage, users, and uses of library findings for the advancement of society. But the topic also presupposes the library itself is a passive site that stores the information and simply urges the user to come and enjoy the fruits of the labor of the researcher who is assumed to lay outside of the place of storage. This assumption is buttressed by the ways in which we have seen libraries as places in which we go for information which somebody else has generated and which we can put to many users. Even though many things have happened to libraries to make them both storage and to make both storage and users of information arguably easier, perhaps the time has come to consider ways of making that effort even more beneficial than it has been. And as we do so, we need to look at transforming not only national, but the continental agenda. And I wish to draw our attention, especially to the AU Agenda 2063. Universities in Africa also are doing their best under the circumstances to demonstrate their capa capacity for innovation and, and set up revolution centers that can enhance the educational value chain. Perhaps more can be done by working more closely together with and within the community and by appreciating the real needs whilst addressing both local and global knowledge demands. And I think this is where the AAU comes in, as a strong body that pulls all the universities on the continent together. I'm happy that the meeting is taking place here, and it's about knowledge, and it's about research, and it's about CARLIKE, and it's about AAU. The transformation agenda is further critical to service the commitments of Africa's Agenda 2063, as well as the SDGs of 2015. The Agenda 2063 presents a Pan-African vision of, quote, an integrated, prosperous, peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the global arena, unquote. This agenda calls to action as a collective vision and roadmap for the continent, with a commitment to speed up actions in a, in a number of areas, including eradication of poverty, catalyzing education and skills, transforming, industrializing, growing our economies, consolidating our agriculture and agribusiness, addressing climate change, and so on and so forth. I believe we all know the uh, 2063 agenda. And what is most significant for me is that 
This agenda has been re-echoed in the SDGs as part of a commitment to achieving sustainable development in three dimensions, economic, social, and environment. And this is supposed to be achieved in a balanced and integrated manner. The universities and research centers, therefore, are at the forefront of supporting these processes in various dimensions. I urge that we all appreciate the 2063 agenda that was passed in September 2013, two good years before the SDGs. That should also be at the fore of our thinking because that plays the continent at the center. The SDGs plays the, the, the world, the global agenda at the center. Both are important, but you need to begin from the local and build towards the global. And a similar thing happened in the past. All of us in higher education, where you know, we talked about it, we used the Bologna process. But the Bologna process came in 1999. Before then was the Arusha Convention. That had been structured for us in 1981, that we more or less abandoned. I'm raising these just to let us know that when we put all these thinkers together to craft agendas for us, we need to pay attention to them. We need to use them. And the countries that use them advance very, very fast. Yes, we all know that the trends have been changing. We have the figures about how the continent is doing well, which is very, very important and very, very in, um, impressive. But we may want to take inspiration from the AU We Want 2063 as a critical, very useful document as a people. Since the declaration of this agenda in the 24th Ordinary Session of the AU Assembly, the UN, as I said, has also proposed the SDGs. And I was fortunate enough to be at a meeting in Nairobi about two months ago, where we tried, at least we were doing it for education, to pick from the 2063 and the SDGs and see where the gaps are and where the alignment should be. But then you see the 2063 had been in existence for two years. Anyway. But whatever it is, we know that the flow of information is critical to the realization of all these goals whether it's the 17 goals, whether it's the MDGs that we were not even able to satisfy as a continent. And I keep talking as a continent because, you know, uh, we all know the history of our countries. We all know the um, 1844 conference that brought us into being. We all know how interconnected we are, even though we think we are different countries. And we also know that continental progression is more beneficial even at the national level the national progression by itself. Both steps are required towards an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful continent, which is envisaged. And earlier African thinkers, both on the continent and the diaspora, have shown the way. We must revisit, examine, and take use from them. A pan-African approach, not a country one, can truly advance each country. Research must support Africa's transformation agenda and continue to strive towards an attainment of the goals as outlined. In this respect, universities and research libraries have the responsibility of posing and finding answers to difficult situations. This comes about as a result of a serious attitude to research, properly funded and oriented to confront national problems as defined and this is what is done by research everywhere. Every so often, you know, people say, oh, how about my own research? What makes me happy? But you are part of a society. You cannot be happy when everybody else is not. And we also know that, you know, whatever research um, agenda we get on, there are always expectations. There's nothing like, oh, here's money for you, do what you like. Or maybe there's, even then, they, they have a sense of what it is that you are likely to do within your discipline. So the kind of unfettered um, agenda 
does not exactly exist. It is the university's um, responsibility to convince government about funding needs. I know, for example, that the AU has proposed that every government should put 1% of its entire money or so to research and so on and so forth. But you see, assuming that we can, uh, the universities can point at what they are doing without this, then that gives somebody the encouragement to know that perhaps if you had more, you would do more. Okay, so, con so CARLAG is very important. UTAG is very important. All these groups that bring researchers together are very important. And we need to consolidate our efforts, forming research groups, especially if they are of the interdisciplinary order. I think sometimes, or most of the time, the results are much better that way. Universities can be interested in proposing pathways to addressing existing social challenges. As sites for the generation of research and libraries, as locations for the storage of the information so generated. These sites must recognize their strengths as the objective thinking hubs of the country. And I want to emphasize as the objective thinking hubs of the country, going beyond whatever it is that you think your persuasion is and looking at the future of the country. I will not ask us what the vision of Ghana is. These centers must initiate, must innovate, they must set targets, provide guiding principles, and others as alternatives to what is being done in order to, prov to provide inclusive policies that bring and keep everyone on board. The managers of research output will need academic researchers, learned societies, funders, institutional managers, repository administrators and libraries publishers, as well as abstracting and analysis services to carry out these expectations efficiently. And this does not need to take a lifetime. We, all we need is to take an honest admission that the models we have been using forever and simply patching them up, revising them, reviewing them, fine-tuning them, reshaping them will never serve the purposes we want them to serve. We need a true paradigm shift that embraces all peoples in their margins and creates the environment that enables everyone to operate towards the center. It is the duty of the university to begin and sustain this process for true, palpable, sustainable development. Therefore, that whole old idea of the university as a place of a few odd people who, you know, <laughs> who only share their own language and uh, they don't have much to do with the environment. No, it's already gone. Again, I, I, you know the university rankings people, the Times Higher Education. Yeah, we had a big conference in Tampa last month and these were the issues that we discussed. The university is no longer what it used to be. There's no human society without memory. And this is made up of its knowledge systems, its law, its discoveries, industries, and more. And from farming to law and imaginative literature to psychology to mathematics and beyond, every subject needs to be investigated and its results shared with everyone. The place of indigenous knowledge and its management for national development is critical in any society. What we may choose to call modern or cutting edge, or we have, a, um, we have a way in which we describe new machines in this country. I'm trying to remember the phrase. State of the art, which I find is so funny. State of which art? <laughs> a state is a state. Let, let's think of the language. A state is a state. This is the state. But it developed and got to the state. Is it staying there? Anyway, that's something else. <laughs> So whatever it is that we may call them, we need to recognize that they are simply the advancement of existing knowledge. That's what it is. The problem is when we pick them midstream. It's like freezing a, a, a river midstream. The river has moved. And so you are still with your ice block. 
and you wonder why things are not changing. Things will not change. We must strive to develop what is known, what is tried, what is available, and what is subject to advancement. A local community's traditional technology, social, economic, and philosophical learning, which is grounded in useful spirituality, applicable skills, productive practices, and ways of being that serve the true purposes of life as experience could engage the university and the research library. Arguably, a society develops better that way than to pick up finished products in whose history mistakes, processes of development are not shared and sometimes are not even known. Now before I conclude, or as part of my conclusion, let me state that the managers of research output, and this time I address Carlyle directly. We, Carlyle must review, should I say our, since we're all part of it, so we're all in the same boat. We must review our established ways of managing research outcomes. We must review our approaches the ways in which the information so accrued can be effectively disseminated, not only to those who come to seek the, the knowledge in our domains, those we know, and those they know where to get the, life, the information. We need to go beyond that. The culture of the library must be amended to meet the needs of an economy such as ours in which participation by the informal sector remains strong and levels of illiteracy are significant. Let us be reminded that intelligence, innovation, entrepreneurship, improvement, new ideas, advancement of knowledge, and indeed development defined as translating into improved life for all are not the domains and responsibilities of a few. They are the domains and responsibilities of everyone, regardless reading ability, regardless social standing, even regardless the ability to visit the center of knowledge. So I'm charging Carl, we need to move out of the library. We need to make sure that the person who is sawing a piece of wood has the latest way of doing it. That person will not come to the library these are the people who form the bulk of our economy. We cannot keep the top cutting edge or state of the art research <laughs> in the library, expecting only a few people to come. How about those who cannot read? How about them? Do they matter? I think they do. And I'd like to hope that so do you. And this is done when we consider Carlyle's own vision, which is to create a world of equal access to knowledge. We know we don't have equal access. We don't. Only a few people have access. And those few people, it's a small percentage. I don't have any data. But I believe you know the people who visit your libraries. If it's in the university, you have a catchment area. Are we interested in the people in the town where the university is sited? Do they come to, to our libraries? Do they come to our research centers? Do we reach out to them? One of the things I used to worry my registrar about when I was vice chancellor was that here is Amin factory just across from the road. So one of the first things I said, let's go there. What do they do? We have a school of agri, we have business, we have these, you know, we have all these nice courses. We are not saying they should, but what do they do? When was the last time we paid a visit? So this is the crux of my presentation, that the library must step out. And how do you do this? Through whatever means necessary. Whether it is by translation, whether it's by seminars, public education, whatever appropriate methodology you can devise to reach out. The information is not for a few people, whether it's about health, whether it's about food, whether it's about whatever. Because, and it's not simply because 
we are funded by the public. But because it is the right thing to do. And Carlyle, I think that by so doing, you cut, you carve out a unique identity that others might even wish to emulate. Thank you all for your time. Thank you very much. A louder one for the minister, former minister of education. Thank you so much, Professor Nana Jane Opuku Ajiman for such an insightful presentation. My takeaway point in the global agenda that have been set by the AU and the UN, information sharing is key. Information sharing is also the lifeblood of higher education. And then universities must find a way to bridge the gap between them and then the society. And especially the libraries should review the ways of disseminating information to reach all, all, all. I guess you two have taken something home. All right, thank you so much, Prof, for such an inf insightful lecture. Um, we would let the chairman for the occasion, Professor Etienne Hile, the Secretary General of the AAU, to give us his closing remarks. Then we'll bring the opening ceremony to an end. Thank you, MC. Honorable Minister for Information, Honorable Professor Nana Jin Opoku Ajiman, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, our opening ceremony program has now come to an end. Before the closing prayer, I would like to commend and thank our speakers, mainly Professor Nana Opoku Ajiman, our keynote speaker, as well as the Honorable Minister for Information, our guest of HANA, for the time secured to attend the just ended opening ceremony. Once again, I welcome you all to Kalai Third Conference, and let us move to the first plenary session after the group photo. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Uh, I'll still call on the Honorable Minister for Information to come and then open the exhibition. Okay, we'll do that down there. And um, okay, so we will do the photograph, the group photograph outside, just after which we do the exhibition. And then uh, before that, we will take the opening, I mean, the closing prayer. We'll take the opening, the closing prayer by Pastor Randy Komi. Pastor Randy Komi. All right. Please, shall we be up and standing? <laughs> You're going to join me sing this simple song. Yeah, da wa si nya mie. Yeah, wa si ya da wa si. Yeah, da wa si nya mie. Yeah, and I will see. Yeah, I will see you. 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 Yeah, and I will see. Give us 
sweet fragrance of knowledge and wisdom and raise us to the highest pinnacle of glory. Other are steps in thy word and let no iniquity have dominion over us. Plant us by rivers of waters. Let your blessings make us rich and have no sorrow to eat. And you will not withhold good things from us. But goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. Raise us so high. And let us be like Mount Zion. We cannot be moved nor abide forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so you will surround us now and forever. Let us always be at the top, not the tail. Let us be winners, not losers. Movers from beneath to above. And the blessings that will come to us will all the time overtake us. Let the peace of God which surpasses our understanding, keep our hearts and mind through Jesus. And unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before thy glorious throne with exceeding joy. And to our only true God, peace, power, dominion, now and forevermore. Let's share the grace together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forever. Surely, Good next and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life, and we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor. All right, let's allow the dignitaries to walk out. Kindly take your seats, and then let the dignitaries step out. Then we'll follow them, and then go to the stands. The minister will open the exhibition. Then we'll take a group photograph and we can do the tour. Okay, we can follow them. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. 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 I'